around my story. This time, you get to know the truth about the haunted piano. I left. I went to work. Then I came home and went to bed. Everything was back to normal, just as I told myself it was. Music started playing again. That's when it hit me. This was not paranormal. It couldn't be. It was a cheap trick. Margaret must have programmed the piano to play itself. It was just a prank. A laugh at my expense. That's why the damn thing was free. I ran downstairs to solve the mystery once and for all. Like clockwork, as soon as my foot touched the bottom step, the piano stopped playing. I walked over to it, confident in my new theory. Upon opening it up and exploring all of it, I was surprised by what I saw. It was just a normal piano. Nothing extra was added in its creation to make it play on its own. My calmness was not calm anymore. I stared at the red wood and ivory keys before me and almost felt compelled to ask, what are you? Instead, I remained silent. This silence, however, was quickly interrupted by the sound of music as the piano began playing itself once again. I wanted to run, but fear kept me still. I watched the horror unfold. The keys were being pressed down hard, controlled by an unseen force. A hunting piece filled the room as pictures fell from the walls. The house began to shake around me. My eyes darted back and forth in fear. But then I noticed something outside. Standing at my window was a shadowy figure. I ran outside to escape the madness. All the while the song went on. The house continued to shake behind me. The dark figure was nowhere to be seen. Margaret has not rigged the piano to play on its own, but I was not losing my marbles either. This was something entirely different, something out of this world. All at once, the music stopped playing, and the world around me with it. No wind, no cars, no animals, and no people. Nothing. It was the middle of the night at this point. But where were the crickets, the frogs, or even the trees? Where was life outside my home? A little exploration revealed that I was truly by myself. Every living creature in the world had disappeared. What the hell was going on? Why was this happening? I returned home, hoping for answers, but instead, I saw an unsettling sight. It was so dark, I almost didn't see it. Standing completely still next to the piano was the same silhouette from my window. My body was shaking with fear, but the figure did not react. It was frozen like the rest of the world. The shadow was wearing a dark cloak, one that covered its entire body. At its face was nothing but pure darkness. I studied the figure for a few more moments before a familiar sound filled the room. The piano song played, and in an instant, the world returned to life. I fell to the ground, but managed to escape, crawling out the front door and rushing over to my car. I got in and took off with no specific location in mind, happy to be anywhere that was not my own home. I started weighing my options, destroying the piano came to mind, but the risk outweighed the reward. It could just as easily backfire, angering whatever spirit was haunting its keys. Seeking help wasn't really an option either. The only person who might believe me was Margaret. That was it, Margaret. Maybe she would know what to do. It was late, but I didn't care. I drove over to her place. The dark figure was there, standing at her door. Before I could turn in the opposite direction, it grabbed me by the arm with its bony fingers. Its strength kept me anchored in place, and then it disappeared. I had no choice but to return home. I hesitantly stepped past the piano and walked up to my bedroom, where I locked the door and fell into bed, mentally exhausted. I would not have even a moment of peace. 
As the song started up again, the second my head hit the pillow. But I remained still, sick of the repetition. The banging on my bedroom door that followed, however, succeeded in freaking me out. I jumped out of bed and pushed my dresser to the door, and I hid under my sheet. The banging persisted, but I chose to instead focus on the song, allowing myself to properly listen to it for the first time. Surprisingly enough, it was beautiful. Dark, but beautiful. Its melody soothed me, relaxing me to the point that my eyes grew tired. I fell asleep and I had a dream. The dream world I found myself in was different. It was overwhelmingly vivid and real. Words like surreal and otherworldly just don't cut it. The awareness I had is also difficult to explain. I was completely aware of my surroundings in the sense that I could feel everything about them. I know that doesn't make much sense, but it's the only description I have to offer. The dream was in a forest. It was large, and at the center, a large red tree stood tall. Every fiber of my being knew where I was. This was the blood tree, the precursor to my piano. As I admired the beauty of the blood tree, a person stepped out from behind. He did not speak. He simply pointed at the tree. This is when the piano leaked into my dream. The song played as glowing lines ran up and down the tree's bark. The man put his hand to the wood, motioning for me to do the same. And I did. It was an incredible sensation. My eyes were filled with visions, a glimpse into the blood tree's past. Its bark wasn't always red. Native habitats came up to the tree every year. They would slice their hands open and place them on the tree's trunk. Their blood then dripped to its base, representing the lifelines of their people. It also signified becoming one with nature, feeding the tree life from within. It was the anchor that kept their community together. This is where they gathered and enjoyed life. A place free from worry, a safe place. This was also where the natives buried their dead. After that, one of the elders would play a song. The same song my piano played every night. It was their song of death. When it was all over, a final offering of blood was taken from the fallen and painted on the blood tree, granting their spirit safe passage to the afterlife. When the vision stopped, my new friend released his hand from the bark and pulled out an unusual instrument. He began playing the song of death, but then stopped. He handed it to me and motioned for me to play instead. I wasn't sure what he was up to, but felt no need to deny his wishes. With little practice, I was able to get the hang of the instrument and play the song. As I played, the blood tree began wilting, its bark changing from red to black. My friend was ecstatic. For one reason or another, this is what he wanted. It wasn't until I woke up later in bed that the pieces of the puzzle clicked into place. Margaret's grandfather had taken away the native's headstone. He violated their connection to nature as well as with one another. The tree and its spirits had to be put to rest, and once and for all, there was only one way to do this. I can't explain how, but I knew I needed to play the song of death on the piano. The whole way through, without interruption. It was the only thing that would break the curse. I ran downstairs and put my plan into action. When my hands touched the keys, the house violently shook, knocking frames and furniture all over the place. I kept my composure. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the dark figure standing at my window again. Still, I continued. I had an obligation to preserve. If not for the tree or its ghost, then for myself. The nightmare had to end. They roamed around the room, 
Sometimes next to me, other times breathing down my neck. I paid no attention on the outside, but my bones were shaking. I had come too far to lose my balance now. Just as the shadowy figure sat next to me at the piano, I struck the final note of the song. The madness around me stopped. I turned to the figure beside me, and it was the native for my dream. He threw me a thankful smile before vanishing. My work was done. Months have passed, and the piano remains in my living room, quieter than it's ever been before. I even play it from time to time. If there's one thing you can take away from my experience, it's to be mindful of the things that make sounds at night. Try your best not to be frightened, and please let this tale be a warning to you. Don't ever buy strange things from Craigslist. You'll thank me later. I am addicted to food. I suffer a lot. I need help. I've tried to give up, but I fail every time. Hamburgers. Who can give up eating hamburgers, especially with barbecue sauce? I didn't mind this kind of addiction, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me begin by introducing myself. I am Patricia, 15 years old, living with my parents and my brother. I lead a quiet life, no interests, no hobbies, except for eating that is. Food is my faithful friend. It never leaves me. It is my partner, my soulmate. But having food as your soulmate has insidious side effects. A dark side, if you will. It denies me a healthy life, robs me of the energy to play, and causes me to sleep excessively. I would much rather stay at home with a bag of potato chips than go out and exercise. My soulmate ultimately betrayed me, though, last Thanksgiving at my granny's home. She lives in a state nearby. Granny was a clever doctor and an excellent cook at that. She could conjure up something really delicious. On that day, she had prepared barbecue turkey with nuts and other secret recipe ingredients. The taste was so great, as if it had descended from heaven itself. I felt like I was fighting a food war and I had to win at all costs. I ate and ate and ate. I don't know why, but I just couldn't control myself. I attacked that turkey like it was the last on the planet. But every culinary war with a worthy adversary, such as the barbecued turkey, has its own unique type of casualties. Suddenly, I found myself unable to breathe. I fell to my knees and passed out. The turkey had won. I woke up later in the hospital, though, still clinging to an unfinished turkey leg. The doctor told me that I was gaining way too much weight. He said that I should be put on a diet. Diet? Man, how I hated that word. It hung over my head like the Sword of Democles. It meant depriving me of my passion, my reason for living. I considered eating vegetables in small amounts to be the worst form of cruel and unusual punishment. The worst form of torture imaginable. Imagine thinking of a wonderful, greasy, cheese-laden pizza with all the toppings and then suddenly opening your eyes to find a healthy green salad bowl. But I had reached a turning point in life. One day, my brother was playing on the street. While I was sitting at home, gazing longingly at a tempting piece of cheesecake, just sitting there, taunting, daring me to eat it, I struggled mightily to resist the urge. But in the end, I succumbed and wolfed it down like a starving animal. Shortly afterwards, I began feeling dizzy, but I was unable to call for help this time. And then, I passed out again. I was taken to the hospital, while lying in the hospital bed, half conscious. I overheard the doctor say to someone, she needs to stop eating or it will be the death of her. I thought to myself, whoa, death? So I made up my mind right then, right there. I resolved to fight a new war, a war against my appetite. On our way back home, I told my father that I wanted to see a nutritionist. He was delighted to hear that. Later, at the clinic, the doctor welcomed us in. She told me how to overcome my eating fetish. She gave me a strict diet regimen with a schedule full of healthy meals. I kept telling myself that winning this war was possible. I simply had to be patient and persevere. I stuck to the strict diet and did some physical workouts. My parents supported me wholeheartedly. I was enthusiastic. I can totally do this. A week passed quickly and I eagerly visited the doctor to receive some good news. 
when the doctor weighed me and told me that my weight hadn't changed at all, I was crestfallen. She looked at me and asked me, how was this possible? I told her I didn't know because I was following her diet thoroughly, though it did require a tremendous effort on my part. Another week passed and again I went to the doctor. The results were the same. She said to me, Patricia, are you sure you're following the diet I prescribed for you? I said yes. She sat there wondering. Then she told me with a puzzled look on her face, it's odd, but your weight is increasing, not decreasing. This unexpected piece of news mystified me. Another week passed. No change. The doctor was nonplussed. I returned home with a dejected look on my face. My father asked me what was wrong. And when I told him, he laughed. Do you believe that? My father actually laughed at my predicament. I was furious. He gestured an apology with his hand and then told me that it was my own fault. I was puzzled. What are you talking about? He told me that I had been sleepwalking to the refrigerator every night and eating everything in sight. I was taken aback. I couldn't believe it. Stop acting like he didn't know it, he said. You must have been awake. I replied, no father, I'm not acting. I was truly unaware that I've been sleepwalking and eating in my sleep. But now that we've finally solved the mystery of the increasing weight, we returned to the doctor with this new information and told her the situation. She laughed and told me that my discipline had denied my body the food it craved, but my brain had refused to cooperate and had overridden my will by urging me to eat in a subconscious state. She told me not to worry though, that she could treat that. Armed with this knowledge and her support, and the support of my family, I felt that I could finally win this war. My name is Keanu, and I'm 13 years old. I am a psychopath. I freely admit it in front of all of you. I attribute my sickness solely to my father, because any story about a cruel father pales in comparison to my father. He would abuse me physically, mentally, verbally, and emotionally in every given moment. He left no stone unturned in this regard. He would beat me into unconsciousness. He accused me of being the cause of my mother's death, who died during my childbirth. Whenever dad had any problem at home, he would accuse me of being the cause of it. <laughs> One time he even beat me at school when my teacher called him to school because I had beat up my classmate who had beaten me up first. I tried to explain to him, but he wouldn't listen and he just beat me even more. One day, it was fun day at school and everyone was supposed to invite their parents to visit the school for party and introduction activities. I chose not to invite my dad so I was alone at the festivities. I felt envious of all my classmates for having loving parents to have fun with. My teacher noticed me alone, came over and offered to be my parent for the day. I was so happy. We had great fun together. Miss Linda had lost both her husband and her son in a plane crash, only she had survived. After fun day had passed, Miss Linda showed more interest in me. She would bring me sandwiches and spend time with me during breaks. I thought of her as my mom. When I succeeded in my final exams, she hugged me with tears of joy. I unconsciously said, thanks mom. I went home happy that day, but had to face my dad again. He asked me why I was late coming home, and I told him about having to pass my final exams. He didn't believe me though, and asked me to show him proof. Unfortunately, I had none so he began kicking and punching me. There was a knock on the door. He tried to block me from opening the door, but I managed to open it. Miss Linda was standing there. She glanced at my bruises and bloody face and moved between me and my dad to protect me from further abuse. Dad snarled and threatened her with a beating if she didn't leave immediately. But she hit him in the eyes with a blast of mace or pepper spray and he went down to the floor in extreme discomfort, grabbing at his eyes. Miss Linda called the police, told them about Dad's child abusive nature, and had him arrested. Now I live with Miss Linda as my new mom. Dad is in prison, where I hope he stays till he dies or rots. <laughs> Either outcome is okay with me. I am Brenda's child, or at least I was because my grandmother had died and my mother at some point in her life felt that drugs would be beneficial to her. I was put into foster care at the age of two and adopted at the age of seven. 
I have no real memory of Brenda, just her name and the last time I saw her. I was seven, and I had gone to a foster care agency for a visit. She brought me some strawberry candy. I remember my adoptive mother telling me to say thank you, and I did. Then Brenda got up and told me she would see me again. I went back to the agency a month later for a visit, and she never showed up. My mother was gone, and I was no longer her child. I was fully aware of being adopted because my adoptive parents, who I've lived with for the past four years, asked me how I would feel being their child, and I said I had no problem with it. So they adopted me and my biological sister at the same time. I can remember that when I got adopted, I was happy, but at the same time sad. I was happy because I had a family, a nice warm bed to sleep in every night, plenty of food to eat, and a place to run around. I was sad because I never got to say goodbye to Brenda, and the last time I saw her, I didn't take in what she looked like. I was sad because she never showed up to me again. She had lied when she said that she would. I'm not sure why I never saw Brenda again, but for years, I looked at myself as an intrusion. I figured she didn't want to see me anymore because I needed things and that would get in the way of her buying her drugs. When I went to sleep, I'd have dreams that Brenda had been looking for me and found me. I'd have dreams that she would recognize me and come up to me and say, it's me, your mother. But I never talked about these things. I guess I just didn't see the point. It wouldn't have changed the feeling of loneliness that she had left behind. My adoptive parents didn't make it that easy for me to talk either. It wasn't that they weren't good to me. They took me on road trips, they took me to, and great adventures, and they got my hair done every two weeks. They gave me a stable home, something I probably would have never had if I had been in foster care or still lived with Brenda. But my adoptive mother jumped to conclusions when I would try to tell her little things about boys or school or anything that happened in my life. She always assumed I was getting in some kind of trouble. So there wasn't any way I would have told her about my most painful private thoughts, even if I had thought of telling her. Instead, I just tried to be a nice kid who always seemed happy. I would smile, laugh, and joke. I'd come home and talk about everybody under the sun and how they were doing, except myself. I didn't want my adoptive parents to feel as if I wasn't appreciative or that I didn't love them. So I tried to act as if everything was good. When you're adopted, you feel like your adoptive parents at one point or another are going to expect you to be grateful. You imagine they're thinking, we could have left you in foster care. A and I was grateful, but there was still a part of me that was angry at having to be grateful for just being their child. There was a part of me that didn't trust their love. A part that said, what makes you love me when my real mother didn't love me? What's so real about your love? When I was angry, I expressed my pain by either writing or acting out, or sometimes both. At school, I had a quick temper. I got into physical fights and cursed people out. I ran away from home a lot, more times than I can count. My family couldn't understand why I acted the way I did, and neither could I. I just knew that I felt bad. If I was out in the street and the thought of her would enter my mind, I would turn my head and find something to distract me. If I was at home, I would get up and grab a book or watch television. But even while I blocked her out, the hurt continued, and my behavior got worse and worse. I spoke whatever was on my mind and cared very little about how people were feeling. My most common response to anything anybody said to me was, whatever. I was rude, rebellious, and the smallest things ticked me off. I had a non-caring attitude, and the worse I got, the more frustrated and angry my parents got. By the time I was 12 or 13, my mother and I weren't really getting along. She often beat me, and a couple of times she could have seriously hurt me. Whenever I got on my mother's nerves, she would tell me, I don't care who you go and tell that I punished you. If they want you, they could have you because I am tired of you. Or she'd say, I never had this problem with my sons. Why couldn't you be like them? I felt like my mother didn't want me, even though she had adopted me. I felt that she wanted a replica of her children, who didn't act out so much and didn't get in trouble in school standards I could never live up to. 
It didn't help that much that my extended family never really accepted me. Every Christmas, they acted funny towards me. I found out later that some of them never wanted my adoptive parents to adopt me in the first place. When things got really bad with my mom, I went to one of my aunts for help and she threatened to call the police on me for running away. She didn't like me and the truth is, she didn't like my mom either. And she just didn't want to be involved. I ran away for the last time when I was 14, even though my mother wanted me back. I felt she had put me through too much to return. I rejected the only family I had had for the last 10 years. A family I had come to feel didn't want me, but just put up with me, even though my mother wanted me back. I felt she had put me through too much to return. I'm 19 now, and I've been on my own for the last five years. I've lived with a friend, I've lived on the streets, and I've lived in a foster care home. I've grown a lot. But I haven't really come to terms with my feelings about being given up or about being adopted. I have friends and other people who support me now, so to a large extent the feelings of loneliness have disappeared. But my anger has not. Instead of blocking it out, I talk to my boyfriend about it and try to make sense of it all. Maybe one day I will forgive and forget, but right now I feel like the only true family I will ever have is the one that I will one day start. I do have some contact with my adoptive mother. Sometimes I talk to her when I call my sister, who still lives with them. My mother wrote me a letter apologizing for the past, and she has even asked if she could come to my college graduation. I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure I can forgive her yet for all the things she said and did to me that really hurt. I don't think I will ever forgive my extended adoptive family. They weren't there for me and my mother when we were having troubles. They didn't stick by me. They made me feel like they never wanted me. To this day, I carry around with me this feeling of not belonging and this feeling of wanting to belong. When I was younger, I was able to block the memory of Brenda out of my mind, but now it's not so easy. I look into the mirror and I want to know who I look like. If the children I intend to have one day ask, mommy, what was she like, your real mother? I want to be able to answer that, or I'd like my kids to be able to ask her for themselves. It seems like the chance of finding her are as slim as the skin peeled off an apple, so I gave up on that. I realize I may never find her. I'll have to accept that. Still, I want to find her, and the thought of her comes into my mind often. I am angry at her. I am angry because she lied to me, and I am angry because she left me. But I still believe that even if I found out that Brenda was not alive or even in jail, it would bring a sense of closure. It would fill up that empty space in my heart. Do you guys think I should keep looking for her? Or is it too late? Hello, my name is Benjamin and I'm 17 years old. I am sitting in a court waiting to hear my sentence, my punishment. When you listen to my story, you may pity me. My story started three years ago when my parents died in a train crash. My father was a businessman, and my mother was just a housewife. The news of their death was a big shock to me because I couldn't imagine my life without them. I was forced to move in with my grandparents. The hardest period of my life was about to start. My relationship with them wasn't that close. They lived in a city far away from my home, so I visited them in the past only a few days every year. When I heard my friends talking about the generosity of their grandparents, I wondered why, because mine never gave me any presents or showed me any kindness at all. My grandparents lived austere lives, so living with them was hard for me. They were stingy and cheap. Despite living in a villa, we all ate plain meals that barely supplied me adequate nourishment. In addition, we only ate one meal a day. I was always hungry. My room was infested with insects. The furniture was worn and torn. They paid the servant a minimal wage, so her work was minimal as well. I would always sneak into the kitchen to steal anything I could find in the fridge to eat. When I asked my grandparents why they were living so minimally, they said it was because they were saving money for the future. When they eventually figured out that I was stealing food from the refrigerator, they locked it closed at night. Do you believe that? 
One day, when I entered the study to speak with Grandpa, his safe was open and I glimpsed gold bars, a hefty pile of cash, and a mound of jewelry. When he saw me enter, he slammed the safe closed and gave me a cold look. At midnight, I happened to go to the bathroom and while returning to my bedroom, I overheard Grandpa say, Eat fast before he wakes up. I looked through a slot in the door to see them eating delicious food. Grandma said, I don't know why you insisted on letting him move in with us. He replied, Well, I couldn't let people see me abandon an orphaned grandson. She said, I wish I could wake up one day and find him gone. Her words were like a knife through my heart. I decided then and there that they deserved to die. I wished that they had died instead of my parents. I waited until they went to sleep. Then I entered their room, took the key from their bedside, went to the safe, and stole all their money, gold and jewelry, and put it in my backpack. Then I loosened a heating gas fitting in their bedroom, allowing it to leak into their room. Then I exited, closed the door, and sealed the bottom of the door with a towel. The next morning I took a bus to another town, intending to take the train to get even further away. In the meantime, the police discovered the death of my grandparents. They also discovered that there were security cameras around their villa that had recorded everything I did. As I sat there in the train station, I saw this news on a TV in the waiting area. They were showing my face from earlier news stories when my parents had died in the train crash. Everyone around me was looking at me. It seemed I was a dead ringer for the murder suspect. I was arrested, taken to court, tried, and found guilty on two counts of cold-blooded murder. So here I sit, waiting to hear my sentence. I am ready for any punishment. I feel no remorse. Given another chance, I would do it again. Hi, my name is Jennifer, and you might recognize me as a former famous child star. You might be wondering what happened to my life. Well, I worked as a singer at a local bar in our town. You might be wondering why I never pursued my career. Okay, let's just say they stopped giving me projects when I reached the age of 11. Because the producers said I'm not that pretty to be a teen star. So when I stopped being cute, I became unemployed. Which is not bad. I finished my studies and got a really good job. Also, I have an amazing boyfriend. He's a lawyer and he comes from a very prominent family. But I have this habit of ruining everything that is good for me. I don't know if my boyfriend is still gonna talk to me. You're probably wondering why. Because I just ruined the engagement party of his brother. I was extremely at fault for this. It all happened because of my insecurities. This was deeply rooted when the film outfits started rejecting me when I was really young. Plus, I have two sisters who look exactly like my beautiful mother. I, on the other hand, look like my father. I also inherited his lack of height. Don't get me wrong, I'm not ugly. I'm just not that pretty. And my sisters always make fun of me. But I'm extremely talented. When I sing, I get a lot of tips from people. My employer always gives me extra cash because a lot of my fans go to his bar on a regular basis just to watch my gigs. This is where I actually met my boyfriend Sam. Anyway, before I proceed, kindly make sure you hit the subscribe button. Who knows, you might just win a free ticket to one of my concerts someday. I will start telling you the story by how Sam and I met. One night, I was at the bar and singing at the top of my lungs, then after the performance, all of the customers applauded and requested more. Then, a drunken guy grabbed me by the arm and started to harass me on stage. To my disbelief, I just found myself hitting the guy with the microphone. Sam also happened to be there. The drunken guy and I ended up at the police station. The drunken guy sued me. Turns out he's the son of a very powerful politician. But Sam represented my case and they dropped the charges. That was mainly because there were a lot of witnesses and they testified that I was attacked first. Since then, we became really good friends. And eventually, our friendship blossomed into a beautiful romantic relationship. Sam is a super great guy. 
He didn't give me any reasons to get jealous from any other woman. But also, I realized that I don't know anything about his past. I never really got a glimpse of his world because whenever he asked me to meet his friends or his family, I chicken out. I always take work as an excuse. I always say, I have a gig, brain check, and that's my usual response. Then one time he told me that his mother just came back from a super long trip and that she's interested to meet me. Well, we've been dating for almost a year, and he ran out of reasons to dodge the situation. So I said, yes, let's do it. Before the weekend, I went to the mall to buy a new dress for the meetup. I was able to buy a nice long black dress and I bought some accessories as well. I really wanted to wow Sam's mother so she would like me for her son. I cannot bear the thought of losing him. When I was done shopping, I went to the burger shop and bought one for a takeout. I noticed that it's already 4 in the afternoon. I didn't notice that I skipped lunch because I was really busy picking out my outfit. While walking, I decided to eat the burger and the mustard spilled on my shirt. I look like a careless kid and he smells like pickles now. In my head, I was thinking that's okay because I was about to go home. Then a familiar voice called out my name. Jennifer, that was Sam. When I turned around, I saw that he was with his mom. I quickly ran to the elevator as if I didn't see him. What am I gonna do? I don't want his mom to see me like this. I want her to see me at my best. But then the elevator was too slow. And eventually they caught me. Mother, this is Jennifer, my girlfriend, said Sam. Hi, good afternoon. I responded while shaking. I lifted the paper back so it would cover my stained shirt. Nice to meet you. Well, his mother is nice, but still, I don't want her to judge me. I look and I smell like crap. This is not an ideal way of meeting your boyfriend's mother for the first time ever. I got so pissed. I'm looking forward to lunch tomorrow. Do you have any dish that you'd like to eat? His mother asked. Anything will do. I responded with a forced smile. I know his mom is sensing the awkwardness between us, so I bid them goodbye and hurriedly entered the elevator again. On my way home, I kept playing the mall scenario in my head and I cringed every time. At home, I told my sisters what happened because I was craving some support and I would like to feel better. And even though they're very mean to me most of the time, they're still my sisters and deep inside, I know they love me. What? His mother saw you like that? My eldest sister said with the slightest insult in her tone. If I were her, I would ask my son to stay away from you, my other sister said. I walked out, went to my room, locked it, and called my best friend Maria instead. She said some comforting words that made me feel better. Maybe you're just overthinking and it's not gonna help you, she said. Well, she was right. Anyway, I still have a chance to impress her. On the day of her lunch invitation, I wore the dress I bought at the mall and I went to the nearest salon to get stunning hair and makeup. And I was 30 minutes late for lunch because of this. Sam, his mother, and his two sisters were waiting for me. I apologized for being late. I noticed that they're looking at me with awkwardness in their eyes. Is it because of the dress? Maybe the heels or my makeup? Okay, maybe my hair? Or perhaps it's the elephant teeth accessories? I don't know. Maybe I'm just being too paranoid. But I must admit, I might have gotten a little bit overboard regarding my appearance. I'm way too overdressed for lunch. Hi, they greeted me. They're all very nice and they invited me at the dining area. Sam's mom introduced me to his sisters. After eating, we were all talking and the atmosphere changed into something light. We're all getting along and Sam keeps on bragging about how good I sing. I love singers, would you mind entertaining us? Sam's mother requested. I happily accepted and sang her favorite songs. After a few minutes, I saw his mother and his sisters with their eyes wide open. They clapped so hard and complimented me. 
I can feel that I got the heart of Sam's mother. I knew I had her approval. Then my insecurities quickly struck. I learned that the equally beautiful sisters of Sam are opera singers, on top of being a professor and a freaking doctor. They're pretty, successful, and talented. Me? I felt like I was a big joke. I went home lonely. It felt like my insecurities bottled up even more. The next day, Sam asked me to be his date for their high school reunion. At first, I didn't want to go. But then I realized there was no point of hiding anymore. I met his family, so I might as well meet his friends. At the reunion, I literally felt like I'm the most underachiever and the most unattractive person ever. I'm getting more and more insecure because I feel like Sam's friends are looking at me like a puppy dog. Do I really look like his pet? One of Sam's friends was very nice to me. Turns out she's a big fan of mine and she knows all of my former TV shows. We talked in one of the corners for a few moments. It felt like I belonged. Sam didn't ever make me feel like I don't belong. In fact, I always hear him say how much he is proud of me. He doesn't see me as a failure child star. He sees me as a former child star who's now a great singer. And that makes me happy. I was looking at Sam from a distance, but then I saw a blonde beautiful woman greet him. Oh, I know her. She's a beauty queen. She must be Sam's kind. I asked Linda, Sam's classmate, Why is that beauty queen talking to my Sam? Oh, don't get jealous. They used to date, but everything is over between them. She said, I felt my blood go to my ears. His ex? Linda added, She's the first woman who ever broke his heart. He never had a girlfriend after her. Then it made sense why they chose you. I looked at Linda, but I didn't let a word out. I think she's trying to tell me that Sam chose an average woman because I will not be powerful enough to break his heart. And my heart bled with that thought. I thought to myself if I should break up with him, but he can't, he's too precious. On our way home, I was quite the whole right. I didn't talk to him and I know I left him wondering. I ended the night without talking to him. At home, I called Linda and asked her to come to my place. She said that I'm going crazy and that I don't have anything to be insecure about. If you're really worried, then you should try the beauty pills I'm taking. It works like magic, she said. That might be the solution to my problem. There's no harm in trying. But Maria told me that the side effects are not nice, like always having the urge to pee, dizziness, and mood changes. I did start taking the pills. After a week of taking the pills, Sam got really worried. And that was because I passed out while having my gig. But I kept on taking them because somehow they magically make me feel confident. When Sam's family invited me for the engagement party of his brother that I haven't met yet, I said yes without hesitation. I feel beautiful, but I always have this urge to pee whenever and wherever. And I mean like every five minutes. So during the party, Sam was having a hard time keeping me beside him because I'm always in the bathroom. Then the announcement time came, and Sam came looking for me. I said, I really need to use the restroom. You can do it later, this will be quick, he said. But while his brother was giving his speech, everybody was so quiet and my bladder was gonna explode. And I wanted to tell Sam, but for some reason, I just couldn't. So I started running towards the bathroom, but I got really dizzy and I lost balance. Then I pushed the ice sculpture to the waiter serving near the pool and like a butterfly effect, the waiter pushed the bride and she fell in the pool as well. I ran to them and apologized, but of course all eyes were on us. And to my horror, I was not able to hold my pee anymore. Everyone saw me wet my dress. I was so embarrassed. I quickly ran away from the party because I don't want to talk to anyone, not even Sam. 
I'm not sure if Sam came looking for me or not. But I roamed around their village while calling Maria so she could come and rescue me. I'm on my way, she said. And guess what? I felt the urge to pee again. And so I looked for a dark spot then I peed beside a huge tree. Then I heard a police siren. They aimed a flashlight at me while I was peeing. I quickly put my underwear back on and ran as fast as I could, but then I got dizzy and passed out. Then the police brought me into the hospital and when I woke up, I saw Sam beside me. His sister was the one attending to me. They got so worried about me and they decided to follow me. Sam talked to the police and explained everything. When everything was okay, Sam and I had a talk. I told Sam that I'm taking some kind of beauty pills because I get so insecure, especially that he has a beauty queen ex. Also, I'm afraid he might leave me once he realizes that his family and friends disapprove of me. They do not disapprove of you. You put this all to yourself without a reason, he said. He said his family and friends love and adore me as much as he does. They're happy for him because he found someone who makes him super happy. Then my heart melted when he said how much he loves me. I love you. And that's why I'm letting you go, he said. What? Are you breaking up with me? My eyes were full of tears. He said he needed to stay away from me. And that's because he makes me feel insecure to the point of ruining my own health. I only thought I was doing what would please him. I am going to give you space until you realize how much I love you for who you are, he said. It sounded confusing, but I knew what he meant by that. I never should have allowed my insecurities to eat me up alive in the first place. When I got better after the incident, I stopped taking the pills. And whenever my sisters made fun of me, I started to tell them off. They stopped teasing me ever since. I also learned that I had a lot of fans, and that encouraged me to dream bigger and apply as a recording star. Maria's boyfriend hooked me up with a producer, and I worked hard to become a recording star. Today, I'm famous again, and I have forgiven myself for all the foolishness that happened to me before. And I never forgot about the local bar that trusted me for so many years. I'm now a co-owner, and I still sing in that bar every weekend. And it's still jam-packed. Sam's mother always drops by to ask how I am, and how much they miss me. I know deep inside they want me to get back together with Sam, but he is right. The breakup made me realize a lot of things. Then a year later, I had a beautiful relationship with an average man like myself. And no matter how insecure he gets, I make him feel loved. I always help him realize that he's so much more than what he thinks of himself. But sadly, things didn't work out between us. Just like me before, I guess I'm too much for him. At my launching party, I was so glad to see Sam at the audience. We decided to have coffee, and we were catching up till midnight. I'm happy for what you've achieved. I hope you've forgiven me for breaking up with you. It's for the best. If we stay together, then I would not see the bigger picture, I replied. We both admitted to each other that the feelings never changed. Then I told him that I had a boyfriend, but things didn't work out. Before we parted ways, he invited me to a singing contest organized by his sisters. He said it would be an honor if they would be able to get me as a judge. I smiled and said, yes, I would be happy to do that. A year later, Sam's mother died of a terminal disease and I made sure that I was there for him and his family. Before she passed away, she asked me to look into my heart and see if I can take Sam back into my life. She said that he never stopped loving me and that she would be happy if we got back together. Sam and I took our precious time to build our relationship again. Not just as his mother's dying wish, but also because it was really what we wanted. And since then, I never left his side. Right now, we're married. 
and we have two kids that are cute, talented, and smart. Our son is deaf, but we never failed to make him feel loved. And even if he would grow up not hearing the voices of the people who love him so much, we will make sure that his heart would feel our love for him and will never make him feel insecure. But guess what? He's popular on social media because he can sing like his mother and he's got no hesitations in joining talent searches. Who knew life was so full of beautiful surprises?